We've been looking at the, the fall of man and the implications of it for us in our daily walk, really, because that's what really matters to us. And we looked at Eve and whether or not uh, this was an independent act whereby her demise was witnessed by Adam and thus Adam was not deceived, according to 1 Timothy 2.14, um, but rather that he saw some sort of a catastrophic event that, that he chose then to go after his bride, which would fulfill the uh, type and shadow of him being uh, the first Adam compared with the last Adam. Consideration that this could have triggered like the renting of the whole fabric of the universe and closing off the dimensions that we, we now know to be unseen to the universe of man would also explain how Jesus could walk in the cool of the day with them because the, that same freedom Although we have access to the throne of grace, uh, it doesn't just arrive and we walk in the cool of the day with them. We actually have to set our time aside and go into that secret place to be with them. We just explored all of those options and what could have been. Nobody knows for sure. It's speculation because we weren't there. But I do believe that there's a fair amount of confirmation throughout the scriptures on it. So one of the things for tonight, our little sort of gem, if you like, mm. is uh, the name of Eve. It's uh, A Azar. And it's actually, mm. most people it's, see it written as a helpmate or a helper for Adam. And that's mm -hmm. how it's normally translated in the Bible, is that um, she was a helpmate. But the word actually is a military term and means strong rescuer. The name Azar in the pictographic Hebrew is the eye and a man and a weapon, which translates into the revealer of the enemy. Wow, that's sad. It, it is, but doesn't it show you how much we lose in translation? That's why I like to do a little gem every week. So that's this week's Eve actually means the revealer of the enemy, but it's also a military term and uh, it also means strong rescuer. There was also a type in here. Eve was in Adam before she was born, if you like, without, for want of a better term. And before she became his bride, she was already inside of Adam. And in the same way, that becomes a type <coughs> of us being in Christ from before the foundation of the world. And Adam had to enter into a deep sleep, which some have recorded that it is uh, that they, he went into like a death state because uh, they believe it represents the death before his bride could be brought forth, wow. such as Jesus on the cross. Now, I haven't got uh, the full... Um, teaching on that so I can't say that yeah or nay I'm just putting it forward as being a potential option Adam was also we know to be a type of Christ uh, going after his bride so as Christ came after his bride and the ultimate restoration of mankind back to his original purpose according to the, the blueprints of heaven Adam was to join with his wife unselfishly and he was to look after her and protect her and love her we know from as as christ loves or loved the, the church, church. Mm -hmm. and that is the responsibility of a man in marriage so this business of uh whenever people are dating these days and going dutch and doing everything that's not scriptural at all the man is meant to look after his bride. There was a dowry in the Old Testament. He, you know, the, the bride had to cost him something. Yes. You know, so consider yourself as that uh, you are priceless. Amen. It should, it should cost. Amen. Look after <laughs> you. So get yourself in a, a life that you want to become accustomed to. <laughs> <laughs> I just think I'm better off here with just me and God. Um, yeah. <laughs> from that, pers from the perspective of what we've been looking at, we have been looking at the difference between living a life in Christ uh, to that of that of a carnal Christian 
trying to establish patterns of good works or of behavior modification, which apart from anything else, it's frustrating. It is a futile task and it is purely the work of the soul. And <clears throat> the, the comparison was living the redeemed life from the spirit out with Christ on the throne. We used the temple model to demonstrate this and we compared the, our positional truth to our experiential facts. And that was really important because sometimes we look at our experience and we fail to recognize our position in Christ. And we have to always go back to the blueprint. What or who are we positionally? Um, actually quite a good example would be Prince Harry at the minute who has come away from the royal family, but he's still positionally the the son of the queen you know wherever he goes to live whatever label he chooses to um denounce he, that's still his position he's still the 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 son of the queen this led us down the, a pathway or a study on the pathways of the mind and how we have control over our own thoughts contrary to what we think we have control over our own thoughts and we are told to take every thought captive. And if God tells us to, that means we have the ability to do it. We have the ability and whatever we do with our thoughts directs our life and the destinies that we have in life. Whatever the eye hooks into multiplies. That's the big thing that we have to remember. Whatever we meditate on is magnified. If we meditate on our problems, on our wounds, on the things that have happened in our lives and on our regrets, on our past, whatever we magnify, whether it's the world or, or our past or whatever it is like that, it will grow. So what we need to learn to do is magnify the word. So it's a word that grows. And that comes back to meditating on and soaking in the word because these are the vital components to living the victorious life here on earth. That's what we have to give life to if we want to walk in victory. And too often we are willing to give life to the enemy, to the world, to a system, even a religious system. We think we're not religious, but some of what we do actually turns out to be somewhat religious. And then last week, um, very interestingly, we took up uh, Satan's position. And in a nutshell, we saw that according to the word of God, Satan is a defeated foe, stripped of all of his armor. And thus his only power comes from causing us to come into agreement with a lie. In order to be powerful in our lives, he must get us to agree with a lie. That's where he got his power with Eve. He fed her a lie and he had to get her to agree with that lie. That's the only power he can have in a Christian's life is if we come into agreement with a lie that he gives us. Without this, he has nothing that he can connect to. And we use that scripture that Jesus said, when the prince of this world comes, he will find nothing in or in common with me, which is where the Amplified actually reflects it. And so... If we are believing a lie, and in particular, it's almost always regarding our identity, yeah. what we believe about ourselves and what we're capable of. And if he oh. can keep us as the underdog and we believe that lie, he will keep us from being victorious. If we remember that Satan roams about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The, the word seeking here is the, the big giveaway, because this means that he needs to test who is willing to become his next victim. victim. Who is willing to believe a lie that he will feed them. And that's the test. He will feed you a lie and see if you're going to agree with it. The lie could be something regarding sin, something regarding sickness. But most often its root is found in uh, testing us in the area of our identity. What has he asked you to believe about your identity that you know doesn't line up with the word of God. I mean, the, the first um, case of identity theft was in the Garden of Eden. And we, we know that somebody hasn't got the right to steal our identity. And we know anybody who has had somebody infiltrate their account, and most people have had experience of it nowadays because of the whole internet. But if somebody does that, 
you don't just agree with it and say, well, whatever. I mean, we had uh, somebody went in and took, uh, it was a card that was used in two stores in England and it was buying a computer and ski gear for going skiing. And it amounted to 800 pounds. We didn't just accept that on our statement because we did not spend that money. What we did was we picked up the phone, we phoned the credit card company and we told them that this was not our purchase. And they went in and they told us where the purchases were actually made and what shop. And being in Northern Ireland, it meant it was very easy to prove. And so we got our money back. But you wouldn't just allow them to take that money and say, oh, well, whatever. We don't agree with it in the natural, so we shouldn't come into agreement with it. The spiritual. But in the spiritual, whenever Satan comes in and, and feeds us a lie. Because you know what? Generally, it'll cost yeah. us a lot more than the £800 in the long run. So Satan roams around seeking somebody that is willing to believe the lie, seeking someone he may devour, somebody who's willing to come into agreement with a lie that he's fed them. He needs a lie that you have believed. The lie on its own is, is not a weapon. That's just firing blanks. The only thing that gives him power is when you believe it. That's it. Nothing else. Only The only power he has is when you believe it. That's no different to Eve. As soon as she believed that she... Uh, that this fruit was this lie that he fed her was something nice, something that God was withholding from her. Because we've been looking at the fact that whatever we engage becomes our reality. Whether it is sickness, sin, or truth, lining up with truth keeps us on the path of righteousness, on the path of holiness, keeps us in shalom peace, keeps us in his rest. The other side of that coin is the fact that we have to also make the decision to disconnect from everything that isn't of God. Whatever it is, if it's not of God, God actually says whatever is not of faith is sin. So that is, our, is actually a requirement. Submit to God and resist the devil. That was what we really looked at last week. So on to tonight. We've got to... Verse 7 of Genesis 3. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves <coughs> aprons. Okay, what do we know about fig leaves? What's it telling us in this one? We know their eyes were opened from, from what uh, their agreement with Satan and coming into the, the knowledge of good and evil. What do we know about what they did in this action? Yeah. Fig leaves were a type of covering something shameful particularly spiritual but when you notice that they didn't have a care in the world and suddenly they felt ashamed and guilty yeah I mean immediately that they mm -hmm. entered into that place they were ashamed of what they did and they were guilt-ridden but next week we're going to cover the whole the cursing thing if we get that far uh about what actually happened under each portion of the the curse five verse three says uh, after Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son like himself or in his image mm -hmm. and named him Seth. So what we know is that uh, his children were born in Adam's fallen image. So uh, that's how we know that. And that's where it explains in Romans, all of sin and fall short of the glory of Lord, God. Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, so that every, every person on planet Earth has to make the choice about um, who they're going to submit to. The fig tree. The fig tree is also symbolic of Israel itself. Mm -hmm. Most people are fairly familiar with that. And it's often symbolized uh, the health of the nation Israel, both spiritually and physically. So it's used very often in scripture to symbolize how, the health of that nation or the health of the people or the Israelites. Hosea 9 and verse 10 says, When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. 
Now, I've only picked up a few little snippets of the fig tree, and yeah. I could have picked up uh, a phenomenal amount more, but I've tried to focus, I've tried to keep it a wee bit focused. First Kings 4.25 says, Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan even to Bathsheba, all the days of Solomon. Okay, so here we see Israel, uh, Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree. So again, we're seeing the types and shadows that are in contained in all of this. But later on, we also see uh, that other minor prophets give out warnings to the nation of how God would bring destruction and failure of crops as part of his judgment against them, specifying empty fig trees that were stripped bare and fruitless. And you see this, we've actually been with our KI studying Joel and um, it's in Joel, Habakkuk and Haggai as within the minor prophets. Jeremiah says a huge amount of stuff on the fig tree. What we can see here is that the fig, the fig tree is something of a barometer for Israel. It's used indicatively of Israel, but it's also a, a barometer. And we also see that the fig tree was taken away as a punishment and it flourishes in times whenever he speaks of restoration. We also know that in Matthew uh, 21 and chapter 24, I think, uh, that it's used to indicate the times and the seasons uh, of life. I mean, there it's compared with the weather and the times and the seasons. And so we're expected to know what's going on in the world according to what's going on in Israel. Yes. And that uh, gives us our biblical timeline. Israel gives the world its biblical timeline. Jeremiah 24. This is the message from God from the God of Israel, the exiles from here that I've sent off to the land of the Babylonians are like the good figs and I'll make sure they get good treatment. I'll keep my eye on them so that their lives are good and I'll bring them back to this land. I'll build them up and not tear them down. I'll plant them and not uproot them and I'll give them a heart to know me, God. They'll be my people and I'll be their God for they'll have returned to me with all of their hearts. So you can see here that this confirms the issue of the times and seasons that is being used for. But we're going to move on to the New Testament where one of the statements, have you ever wondered about Nathaniel, the greeting that Jesus gave to Nathaniel when he said to him that he knew him uh, while he was yet under the fig tree? We're going to read it, but it kind of, Nathaniel is so blown away by this. And yet you think, that's not much of a prophecy to get, is it? Mm -hmm. If somebody's going to say something about something they knew about you, to say that they saw you sitting under the fig tree <laughs> the, the doesn't actually really, you know, you're you're kind of waiting for the punchline, aren't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's in John 1, and we'll go to um, verse 46. Mm -hmm. Where was that day? I'm sorry. Uh, John number, John chapter one, okay. verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the Torah, also the prophets. It's Yeshua ben Yosef from <laughs> Nazareth, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathanael answered him, uh, Nazareth, can any good thing come out from there? Come and see, Philip said to him. Yeshua saw Nathanael coming toward him and remarked about him. Here is a true son of Israel. Nothing false in him. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, uh, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. To me, that statement really didn't merit, you are the son of God. Do you know, in a, in a Gentile mindset, and Yeshua answered, you believe all this just because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he said to him, yes, indeed, I tell you that you will see heaven opened and the angels of God going up and down 
and the Son of Man. I used to look at that and feel that it was very convoluted, to be perfectly honest. Not very clear to my mind. Because what we see here is, okay, so he's an Israelite. The fig tree is representative of Israel. And he was sitting under it. And by this great revelation of Jesus that he saw him sitting under the tree, and I'm sure there was thousands of fig trees, why did this impress Nathaniel to the degree that he said, surely you are the son of God? His introduction to him was, Yeshua saw Nathaniel coming towards him and remarked him, here is a true son of Israel, nothing false in him. So what he's saying is this was a productive Israelite. This was, and the King James says, in whom there is no guile. So we actually see here that Nathaniel is being praised for being authentic. That's what he's being praised for, is being uh, authentically the way that Jesus wanted him to be. Because Nathaniel's actually being a little bit insulting regarding uh, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It says here. Jesus had not, did not say this man was sinless, but guileless, which means to be without deceit. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's mean, good. That's a good it, rendering. It didn't say he was sinless. Or no. Was no, it's, it's, it's talking about him being a true Israelite, being what, what at the heart of who he was is what, um, and remember, God does look upon the heart. But when he talks about that, being a good Israelite will have also meant that he was trying to be cooper being cooperative with the, the Jewish system, if you like. Jesus then answers and says, you believe all this, you're going to see greater things. You're actually going to see the heavens open and the angel of God going up and down on the Son of Man. So he's given him a real prophecy here about what's to come, the kingdom. He's talking about the kingdom being brought into play here. We're going to start to see that this is actually a theme that I hadn't particularly picked up on uh, before. We know that in scripture many times that mankind or man is likened to trees. Uh, the fig tree specifically representing Israel um, and being a clear representative uh, or an indication of the nation Israel. The other thing that we know is that what was the one thing that Jesus was said to have cursed? Big tree. Big tree. Big tree. Mm -hmm. But the word for curse is actually not accurate. Whenever you go back to the original translation, it actually says Jesus answered the fig tree. Mm -hmm. Jesus answered the fig tree. So we're going to have a wee look at that because it's actually got so much in it, it's unreal. And it's in Mark 11, where Jesus finds the tree not bearing fruit that uh, it says it wasn't in season. There's a lot of controversy over that, but we're, we're not going to take upon the leaves would indicate that it had the bitter figs underneath it at that point in time. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about those. So we're not going to speculate on that. We just know that it's not bearing fruit uh, at a time when the leaves would indicate that it was. But it also says that it's out of season, that, uh, that it wasn't the season for it. But this is the only time that I can recall Jesus not uh, healing or blessing, but it rather doing something that's uh, contrary to that or apparently contrary. <clears throat> now, as they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived at the place of the stables near Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of the disciples ahead. <clears throat> this is after the... Um, the triumphal entry where Jesus rode in the Jerusalem. The next day, as they left Bethany, Jesus was feeling hungry. He noticed a leafy fig tree in the distance, so he walked over to see if there were any fruit on it. But there was none, only leaves, for it wasn't yet the season for bearing figs. And Jesus spoke to the fig tree, saying, or Jesus answered the fig tree, depending on what, uh, but regardless, he didn't doesn't actually say, that he cursed it. And when you go back to the original, um, I don't think I wrote the original word down, but it does actually mean answered. But he spoke saying, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him. Okay. 
So here we see that he does this one thing, no commentary on it, no explanation, and then he moves into verse 15. Uh, so they clearly, this is an instance, the disciples witness it, and then when they came unto Jerusalem, Jesus went directly into the temple area and overturned all the tables and benches of the merchants who were doing business there. One by one, he drove them out of the temple courts. And they scattered away, including the money changers and those selling the doves. And he would not allow them to use the temple courts as a thoroughfare for carrying their merchandise and their furniture. And then he began to teach the people saying, does not the scripture say my house will be a house of prayer for all the world to share, but you have made it a den of thieves. I would have to say that on the surface of it, it just looks like Jesus is having a really bad day, like he got out of the wrong side of the bed. He was hungry. He didn't find any food. He said, stuff you. He went to the temple and wrecked the place. (laughs) Right? That's right. So, and then he gives out about what went on. There doesn't look to be the same connection between these two things. Then says, when the priest, when the chief priests and the religious scholars heard this, they began to hatch a plot as to how they would eliminate Jesus. But they feared him and his influence because the entire crowd was carried away with astonishment by his teachings. So he and his disciples spent the nights outside the city. Then in the morning, they passed by the fig tree and Jesus spoke to it and was that the Jesus spoke to and it was completely withered from the roots up. Peter remembered and said to him, teacher, look. That's the fig tree you cursed. It's now all shriveled up and dead. And Jesus replied, let the faith of God be in you. Listen to the truth I speak to you. If someone says to this mountain with great faith and having no doubt, mountain be lifted up and thrown into the midst of the sea and believes that what he says will happen, it will be done. Is is that not a form of us, the fig tree? No. Because we are supposed to bear fruit. We are, but the, it is specific to Israel. And I, mm-hmm. the, it's being used in these parables, it's being used as a contrast. Because what I actually saw, which I hadn't seen before, uh, was that when we look at Nathaniel, there's actually a pattern. There's actually a pattern because when Nathaniel comes in, he says to him, you were an Israelite without any guy, without any deception, as you said, right? Mm-hmm. He says, but I'm going to show you a better way. I'm going to show you the kingdom. You're going to see greater things. And you're going to see, uh, and he talks, really, he's talking about Jacob's ladder. And the, you know, the, the mm-hmm. prayer life going up and down cyclical with heaven. But what we actually see here, when we study this out, is we see, that what he is doing here, again, is he's putting an end to the life of the fig tree for that time to introduce, what's he introducing here? He goes to the fig tree. He says, you're not going to bear fruit anymore. He goes to the temple and he says, don't even think about what you're doing. What you're doing is just merchandising. You're just making money and money laundering in my name. And this is meant to be a house of prayer. Jacob's ladder is a picture of prayer, right? Prayer that will bring the kingdom. Here we see in the temple, he comes in, he cuts off the fig tree, he cuts off the temple, and then he says that the temple will be destroyed. And then in three days, it will be raised again. So here we see a connection with the life of Christ and In the life of Christ, what do we see happening? We see after Nathaniel, he talks about bringing in the miraculous. And here we see what he says is, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say under this mountain. So what he's saying is, I am introducing a new system in here. The fig tree was being unfruitful. Why was it unfruitful? Because it was just a religious system. It was a system that was meant to teach them about the Messiah and the need for a savior. And what Jesus was saying was, I am going to destroy the religious system. You think your system is going to get your results. What gets your results is the kingdom, where it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these things will be added. Because I always thought that Jesus' response to the disciples when, when they talked about the fig tree was really weird, to be perfectly honest. You know, he, they talk about the fig tree and he comes in and says, never mind about the fig tree. This is what I want you to know if you say to the mountain. So we've heard all the messages about the fig tree. What, him speaking to the fig tree is a type of us speaking to our mountain. And I'm not disputing that. I'm not disputing that it is a type of that as well. But what I actually seen in this was that it's more than that. This is actually a picture of Jesus shutting down the old system. Mm -hmm. The old right. system of the law and introducing the system yeah. whereby by faith and prayer we access the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something really I would encourage you to look at over this in your in your own prayer time over this week. Look at Nathaniel's story and look at the story of the fig tree being cursed or answered, spoken to, whatever way you want to put it. But I also think when we look at the fig tree in the natural, as you said, uh, what we see are leaves. It should have been producing fruit, right? But it didn't produce the fruit. And since it's a type of Israel, the people of God should have been producing fruit, but they weren't. They should have. They were supposed to be waiting expectantly for their Messiah, and they weren't. Yeah. They weren't. At, they were expecting the Messiah, and as soon as he turned up, they didn't know it was him. And so they they done everything until eventually they killed him. But we can actually see the pattern of the fig tree that the, the kingdom was supposed to be brought into play, but because the Jews rejected their Messiah, the judgment was brought. In fact, we'll have to just look at that now I've mentioned it. I wasn't going to look at it. I hadn't even planned to go there. It's, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he that killeth the prophets, that uh, everything is being removed from the nation of Israel for that time. And it is only temporary. I know that there are those that believe that the church has replaced Israel, and that is Matthew not true. 23. Matthew is also. Okay, we'll read the one in Matthew then, because we'll find that one. 23. But it's also in Luke, I think, 21, but I'm not sure. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you are the city that murders your prophets. You are the city that stones the very messengers who were sent to deliver you. So many times I've longed to gather a wayward people as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were too stubborn to let me. And now it is too late since the city will be left in ruins for you will not see me again until you're able to say, uh, we welcome the one who comes to us in the name of the Lord. But it actually tells you that it's in Luke where it tells you that it's taken uh, from him as a, because thou knewest not the day of my visitation. And that's actually a, a judgment that dates back to the prophecy in Daniel 9 that actually speaks of the actual day that Jesus uh, would come into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, on what people would refer to as uh, Palm Sunday. O oh, city of Jerusalem, you are cities that murders the prophets. You are the city that pelts of death with stones and very mess, the very messengers who were sent to deliver you. So many times I long to gather your wayward children together around me as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were too stubborn to let me. Now it's too late since your house will be left in ruins. You will not see me again until you were able to say. Now the King James actually puts it quite well too. But what it is, it's, it says, because I knewest not the day of my visitation. The prophecy that Gabriel gave Daniel was to the day uh, for whenever uh, Jesus would enter into Jerusalem on the donkey. That is a wee bit of a side issue on it. But we do know that um, the fig tree, again, we see here, God, Jesus is closing it down. He's closing it all down because he has, this is the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem in Mark. And then he gives us the instructions on how we are to live. So we see the pattern here of 
when Jesus comes in, he pronounces the judgment to the Jews for not knowing the scriptures and understanding that this was the very day that he would come in and he was the Messiah. And so he shuts the whole thing down for that time and he enters into speaking about the kingdom. And so the kingdom that was promised to Jews is still promised to Jews as a literal kingdom, but he gives the kingdom unto uh, what we would say to be the church now. And this is, this is what we actually see. I hadn't actually seen this pattern in these parables running through this like this. So Jesus came, he spoke to the fig tree, <clears throat> put it under a judgment and just commanded, just said, that's it, you're finished. And if you look at your Old Testament scriptures, we know that Israel was dispersed after that and then would be regathered at a later stage, which we know happened in 1948. Um, but that, that is very much another rabbit trail, which probably we shouldn't have even touched on. What he does is he deals with Israel. He deals with the Jewish people. He goes to the temple. He deals with how they're running their religious system. Because what he has already said is this is an unfruitful system. I came here hungry, how I wanted to gather my chicks. But instead, what I find is a tree full of leaves boasting of something that they don't have. What he's really referring to is what I see before me isn't a people that I can call my people, but rather an unfruitful religious system. I mean, people go in to the, the study, see on the, the temple where Jesus goes in and he overturns the tables and everything. And they use that as an example of a righteous anger, a reason to, to fight things that in the natural and that's not what jesus is doing he's fighting this with the kingdom because what he actually says is i am i do not want anything to do with this religious system i am only interested in the kingdom Amen. that's what i'm interested in presenting the the use of that is really uh, a bit of an abortion of the text for to say that this is a, a righteous anger that people will use um, in certain circles. Uh, I would say that people are using that as an example to, uh, in this current situation, when pastors are slating other pastors for um, complying with the law. Uh, the pastors who are complying with the law are not slating the pastors who are being rebellious, but the pastors who are not complying with the law are out of line. The way they need to fight the system is with the kingdom, not with the system. Otherwise, they're trying to cast out Beelzebub with Beelzebub. There's, there's a lot of things that are out of line. And this is what Jesus came and saw. Everything yeah. in that day was out of line. It was out of sync. Nobody was doing what he said to do. They were all doing uh, things that would, would promote themselves. I mean, all of that, they, you know, he said to the Pharisees, you, you know, you tithe of your mint and you strain it and that, but look at you, look at what you're doing. These are whitewashed sepulchers and, you know, he challenged all of those things. Vipers. Vipers, yep. Told them they were vipers, they were of their father, the devil. I mean, do we ever want to be told by Jesus that what we're doing is of our father, the devil? Like, that's a real ouch. So the temple, he told them that they were, the, were not to be merchandising in his name. <clears throat> and then the next day he instructed on faith. But what Jesus has done here is he's sandwiched the temple graphics of, of this event of knocking over the tables and the chairs and the money lenders and those that bought. I mean, there's nobody left out. Nobody. Those that sold, those that bought. They sound like the victims. So sometimes whenever we look at people who we think are a victim, there's no mercy in there for this. What he's saying is those that are buying, selling, merchandising, making money off the back of this system. He threw everything out. But what he has done is he has sandwiched this temple issue between the fig tree and the demonstration of the kingdom. And I only saw that today. I only saw that today and I would I would like to 
to hear other teaching on that uh, because it was only when I came in and read that that I, I saw it. So Jesus steps beyond the, the legal Judaic system based on the law and the prophets, destroys the temple model of it and enters into decreeing and declaring, speaking to the fig tree, speaking to the mountain. Remember that if you read this in your own private time and your own quiet time, you will see how what Jesus does is he moves swiftly from Israel through the temple and then into the kingdom mm -hmm. of declaring and decreeing by faith and by prayer, because both the story of Nathaniel and the story of um, the, the, the fig tree mm -hmm. and the temple, they both bring us to uh, a completely different viewpoint on what that's all about. Jesus declares and decrees over the fig tree and then likewise he decrees the fate of the temple over it. Both are to be removed from its place within the system. And that's the big thing that I got today, that it was to be removed from its place in the system. Think about the, um, the synagogue in that day. It was very, very powerful. And it had, it was the system. You couldn't do anything without the system without being a part of it, to be excommunicated from the Judaic system, to be from the <clears throat> synagogue was, was terrible, very, very costly. But there's a, another thing that uh, is often missed in this. What they did, Jesus overturned the tables. So one of the things that I, you can see in it as well is he overturned the tables and the chairs. What is this representative of? Because the chairs are actually seats. If you think about um, seats in any position in government, it's all, yep, it's always authority. Seats always represent authority. And this would have been in that day and age tantamount to a government seat and the people that would have sat at the gates. So this is actually a lesson about their identity because their identity was based upon their position of who they were or who they were seen to be or the priestly garments and the phylacteries that they would have had on their forehead and on their garments and all of the regalia. Everything was all about status. It was a governmental seat, but it was a really boiled down to a matter of their identity. And Jesus just cut, cut them to bits. And I mean, that's really a case of the last will be first and the first will be last. So he cut them down to size really. And some of the lessons from this parable that I thought would be good to have a look at. Jesus wants to see his people waiting expectantly for him. Jesus came hungry, wanting to see the people waiting to greet their Messiah. When Jesus comes, he examines the fruit. In this exact case, it was Israel. He then examined the state of the temple. When he comes and he examines the state of the church, what's he going to find? When people are doing the things that what I said just now, I mean, I'm just using a current example, but you can, you can use examples of those that are on the God channel who are looking money on the back of everything and selling things at quite extortionate rates sometimes. You know, they're, they're selling stuff uh, and promising a blessing that will come with this, which is so wrong because um, freely we receive, freely we are to give. One of the other things that would be current to today is that the gospel is offered to the unbeliever. Their response to this gospel becomes how they will be judged. We are judged on what we do with the gospel message. Will we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? They were judged on will they receive their Messiah? We are going to be judged on whether or not we received the Messiah or the Savior. Jesus. <clears throat> what Jesus did in the temple was he overturned the seats or the seat of authority that they held in, in a human capacity, not, uh, not 
submitted to God at all. The other thing it identifies is the purpose of the temple. The purpose of the temple was to be what? A house of prayer. Yeah. Yep. You have made it a den of, th of thieves, but it was to be a house of prayer. We've been looking at the fact that we are the temple of God and the cleansing of the temple. What temple does Jesus want to be cleansed? Us. Us. Yep, exactly. And the clearest example of cleansing the temple, really, is we need to violently and ruthlessly cleanse our temple, our soul. We actually really need to go full force and decide that we are going to wreck the temple. We are going to tear down those um, seats of government that are ungodly in our lives. Idols. Idols, exactly. The tables of injustice. What is that? That's the woundings of our soul. That's the things that have grieved us and brought us to a place of where we feel things have been unfair in our direction. We have been told to flee immorality. So we have to walk away. We have to repent of our sin. We have to walk away from that sin and not engage it anymore. And we have to overturn the authority that the enemy had. We need to realize now, because what we talked about last week, the positions that we are allowing Satan to hold in our soul, they're illegal seats. The same way as the temple. In the temple, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were holding illegal seats because they were not given a God-given authority over them. The seats, the governmental seats that they were uh, sitting in, those seats, mm -hmm. they're illegal. The, the place that Satan has taken up in our mind and in our soul, he has no right to. There is firing blanks. We need to dispossess the enemy from any rights over any area of our soul. Yeah. And especially over our identity. The seats that he is sitting in or demons are sitting in in our life, they're illegal. There's no rights. And the only way he will get any rights is if we agree with the lie. We need to take over, ruthlessly dispossess him. We need to mm -hmm. overturn his tables and we need to overturn his seats. We yeah. already established last week that the Satan hasn't got any rights. Day of five actually reflects the journey in the vineyard of God uh, with the culmination of it being a song of judgment. And you'll also find that in Jeremiah, I think um, maybe chapter 22 and chapter 31, but you can find them yourselves. Google's great help in there. But what we actually see is that the final result of it is about placing a judgment. Jesus took our judgment on the cross, right? So the judgment of all sin fell upon Christ. And that obviously brought us into union with him. But in turn, from this position of righteousness, we are now to judge our soul. We are now righteous and we need to judge our soul and overturn the tables that's telling us that we're not good enough, that we're not righteous. We need to overturn those tables in our own lives. But there are sometimes areas where we have struggles. Yeah. And when in these areas of struggles, what we need to do is on that table, lay it down, lay our hearts bare with Jesus and with his assistance, overturn the seats that the enemy uh, has thrones erected in our lives. Because yeah. there's some things that are easy to overcome, but there's other things that are not so easy to overcome. And so we, the thrones that have been erected, some of the issues, uh, the biggest one in our life would probably be pride. Pride, rebellion, stubbornness, unforgiveness, bitterness, sin. The reality is we need to purge our temple of everything that defiles it, and causes us to take our focus off of Christ. Mm -hmm. Some of it we'll do on our own, but some of it we're going to have to get some, we'll have to get the help of our counsellor. 
but he's freely available 24 7 and that's the, the best part of the news the faith the fact that jesus takes us straight from the the system of the law uh, eradicating and obliterating all aspects of it and bringing us into the arena of faith and um, just to only believe uh, is a journey of uh, learning the new lifestyle because this system of operating in faith, by faith in Christ uh, is about to be brought in to replace the religious system of the day. We know that um, in Matthew 21 and 24, the fig tree is relating to knowing the signs of the times. And we are actually instructed to know ye the parable of the fig tree. Yeah, yeah. That's not just a little, do you know about that? That's a commandment. We are to know the parable of the fig tree. And since a lot of the, the Jews don't believe in or read the New Testament, then I would suggest that we are supposed to also know the parable of the fig tree, not just the Jews. The parable reflects a number of messengers that God sends with the warnings of the coming judgment. When you read, if you actually look up all the different uh, references to the fig tree, with all of this in mind, you'll read them differently now. When we look that the vineyard and the keeper of the, the vineyard, the messengers of God that were sent, the prophets that were ridiculed, beaten, and even murdered. And there's no, no expectation in that day of, of any taking responsibility or accountability. The Jews have had said, let the curse be upon us when they killed Jesus. And then they wonder why there was persecution came. But they decreed that over themselves for Israel. It's used indicatively of Israel, but it's also a, a barometer. And we also see that the fig tree was taken away as a punishment. And it flourishes in times whenever he speaks of restoration. We also know that in Matthew uh, 21 and chapter 24 I think uh, that it's used to indicate the times and the seasons uh, of life I mean there it's compared with the weather and the times and the seasons and so we're expected to know what's going on in the world according to what's going on in Israel yes and that uh, gives us our biblical timeline there is an expectation in scripture that we take responsibility for the stewardship that we have been given, that we need to take it seriously. What are we supposed to be doing? Not what is somebody else doing? Not what is another Christian doing? Not what is another church doing? What does God say I am supposed to be doing? And what does God say the church is supposed to be doing? And it is clear Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Mm. Preach this gospel message. Preach the kingdom. That takes us on to the, the dialogue between um, God and Adam and Eve, which I didn't know if we'd get to these last few those last few verses, but we will cover them. <clears throat> in verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman that you gave me uh, to be with, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And so again, we can uh, look at this concluding that, that they were naked, they were hiding, and they immediately entered into being vulnerable. They um, were immediately ashamed. They were immediately guilt-ridden. They were immediately embarrassed. They immediately entered into the blame game and they immediately deflected their personal responsibility to the stewardship of the Garden of Eden. 
Mm-hmm. And, do you know, we're not that different today. No. The big thing that they did on that occasion was that they exchanged God consciousness for self-consciousness. It became all about me. I am ashamed. I am in fear. I need, I want, represents religious efforts or good works. The problem required a savior to come in with his answer. But remember we said about agreeing with a lie. One of the things that I want you to note in this was what God said. Who told you you were naked? By implication, God knows that Satan told them that they were naked. Mm-hmm. what lie have you believed and consented to or covenanted yourself to because this was the lie that made them feel ashamed why did so, God ask them where are you when they already knew because I think that it was a, like rhetorical you know whenever you might say to the child what are you doing you can mm-hmm. see what the child's doing and you know that it's going to put them in danger or damage something or that they're going to be sorry Mm -hmm. and you don't actually mean can you explain to me what you're doing what you actually mean is wise up Mm -hmm. well I think it was because he wanted a conversation with them that's only my personal opinion because he already already knew where they were yeah he was looking an explanation wasn't he Mm -hmm. it's the same with us Sometimes he says to us, where are you? Yeah, because we're not where we should be. No. So anybody got any questions or comments on that? 